So inshallah, um, we'll get started. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-asr inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. On behalf of MCMC, I'd like to welcome everyone, especially uh, Sister Shima Majiduddin and Brother Mubin for uh, helping us deal with, uh, with the topic that we're going to talk about today, which is suicide, uh, the myths, the realities, what are some of the things that we can do to identify and uh, address, and what our dean teaches us in this regard. Again, it's going to be an informative introductory session. There are no hard and fast black and white answers. So, uh, but we are very honored to have uh, Sister Shima with us and uh, Brother Mubin. Um, a couple of things on logistics. So Sister Shima will speak till around 6.50, 6.55 p.m. Uh, we will break for Maghrib, pray Maghrib and come back. And then Brother Mubin will speak until um, I believe Isha is at 8.30. So then afterwards, the good news is for the few people here, we'll have lots of food. So not only for yourself, but for your family members as well, if things go the way they are. But the also the plus side is this allows for a much more interactive um, uh, discussion and session. So without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Sister Shima uh, Majiduddin. She is a licensed therapist. She has a master's degree in counseling psychology from Rutgers, and uh, she has been working for uh, quite some time with various communities, helping them deal with and talk through issues of, of loss, depression, mental health, mental stability. Um, and when I spoke with her, she literally, she made time for this and to, uh, to come to our center here and, and uh, help us think through these things. So with that, uh, Sister Shima, I'm going to turn it over to you. Assalamu alaikum and welcome from MCMC. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. So I'm going to try making this as interactive as possible. So when I ask a question from the brother side, you can just shout out what you believe the answer might be. Um, but as a brother mentioned, um, I am a licensed therapist and I've given quite a few um, presentations on suicide prevention. And the key word here is prevention. We want to prevent anyone in the community from committing the ultimate sin, right? From ending their life and not having a place where they can go and talk. So I really appreciate that MCMC is doing this because we're talking about a topic that sometimes isn't easy to talk about, but I'm hoping that I can provide you with the tools on how to have a conversation, how to make the space that you're in comfortable for somebody who is struggling to speak up, say what they're doing, and then you being able to provide them the resources that they need. Now you might have seen um, the NPR article, right? American Muslims are two times more likely to attempt suicide than any other group. Now, this may be a very debatable topic. How accurate is this number? What was the research method used? So there could be a lot of discussion around how accurate this is, but one thing I can definitely say is that suicide and depression doesn't discriminate. I don't know how accurate this number is. I honestly don't know. But I do know that it doesn't discriminate on base on your religion. Suicide doesn't discriminate based on your gender, where you come from, what county you live in, what, what masjid you pray at, all of these things affect all communities. So that is why it is so important that in this community we are having this, this conversation. Um, and even though it's in the news, I think it is something that has been around for a very long time in every religious group and in every community. Um, so we were discussing when we met um, to talk about Surah Bakra, right? So surely we will be tested with something of fear and hunger and a loss of wealth and lives and fruits, uh, but give good tidings to the patient. And now when everyone, anyone is dealing with anyone with any type of mental illness, you have to have a lot of patience, right? 
Sometimes it's just very hard to understand why someone can be so sad when they have everything. How can you be so sad when the sun is shining, when you have a beautiful house, you have food on the table? And this is the essence of patience, is not to understand that mental health is just like your physical health. So if I have a headache, sister, if you have a headache, what do you usually do? You, you just take a painkiller, right? If someone is sad, what do you tell them? When someone is sad, what do you tell them? Yeah, when they're sad and they're crying, what do you tell them? You want to comfort the person, right? And sometimes that sadness goes beyond one hour or two hours or three hours. And then your patience is really tested. Why can't I snap this person out of how they're feeling? And that's where the true patient comes in. Because sometimes people's sadness and heaviness last for such a long time that sometimes the only means of dealing with it for them is not medication. Is that There's no way out. So then they turn to thoughts of suicide. And that's where today comes in on what you can do to help them change that thinking. So let's talk about some myths and facts, okay? So I'm gonna put this out there. So is this a myth or a fact? Talking about suicide with someone will give them the idea and make suicide more likely. So brothers, sister, whoever wants to shout out the answer, is that a myth or a fact? Talking about suicide will make them think about it more. Somebody said myth. Okay, tell me why you think that's a myth. It's already there. We don't have to stimulate it. And if we talk about it, they're going to do it. If we talk about suicide, I'm giving them the idea to do it. Is that a myth or a fact? So sister says it varies from person to person. Somewhat true, right? Somewhat true, depending on how you say it. So some people might be thinking in that direction already. Right, the idea is already there. So talking about suicide makes someone more likely doing it. It's actually a myth, right? No matter whether they're do, thinking of it or not, talking about it gives them the space to feel comfortable and say, okay, I'm not feeling good, but let me talk through it. The biggest thing you can do for someone who is suicidal and feeling down is letting them have a space where they can talk about it without any judgment, right? It also gives you a chance to say, okay, where are they in this? And when I talk about give you a chance, I'm going to tell you what type of questions you can ask to help them. So it gives you a chance to evaluate the response and determine, okay, how can I help them? How serious are, the, are these thoughts? Do they have a plan? And are they going to act on it? And that's where you come in. That's where the community comes in, where we can create a space that allows people to say, yeah, no, I don't feel good. Yeah, I have these thoughts. I don't want to commit the most, the worst thing possible, the most finite thing. Okay, let's try the next one. So is this myth or fact? Suicide only affects people of a certain gender, of a race, financial status, age, religion. Myth or fact? Myth. Somebody, why is that a myth? Exactly, exactly what I said earlier. Suicide does not discriminate based on your any kind of any kind of status that you have. Suicide does not discriminate. Some communities, uh, suicide can affect anyone. So um, amongst racial and ethnic groups, it varies depending on where you are and what resources you have. Now, one thing before I show you the stats, um, between men and women, there is a big difference. Statistically, in the United States women attempt suicide at higher rates, twice as higher rates than men. Two times likely to attempt it, not die by suicide, but attempt it. But men are four times more likely to die by suicide. Why do you think men die at higher rates than women when they attempt suicide? That, they, have a, they have a better plan. Somebody was saying what they choose. Can you elaborate on that? What, were you, what they choose? Exactly, the means by which they do it. Women use less violent means, right? So they attempt at much higher rates, two times higher they attempt than men, but men use more permanent and violent means. So that's why they are four times 
more uh, die by suicide by four times uh, more likely to die by suicide. So this is important to note, right? So you may hear more women coming to you about it. But men, if you hear a gentleman coming to you about it, you do want to interject and ask, okay, what is the means? Do you have a plan? And if they do, being able to intercept that. And we'll talk about how to intercept that. Okay, myth or fact, suicides. Let's talk about our youth for a little bit, okay? Let's talk about our college, high school and college age children. So suicide is a leading one of the leading cause of deaths of college students. Myth or fact? Who said fact? Okay, tell me why you think that's a fact. Pressure for the student, more things they're taking on from, from home and from school. So they're taking on a lot, right? And the way their brain is developed, they process it very differently. So this is, this is true. It is actually, yes, this is one of the leading causes. The second leading cause of death amongst college age students and third leading cause amongst 15 to 21. So this is important because this is the age group we really need to have the conversation. Now, this is the second leading cause of death. Does anyone want to take a guess what the leading cause of death amongst this age student, adolescents is? Drugs is on the list. It's not number one. Bullying leads, bullying actually falls under depression and suicide. Accidents. Accidents are car accidents, accidental deaths. Those are the number one cause of death amongst this age group, just accidents, because their, their brain functions away. Risk is looked at very differently. So they may drive faster. They may not think before doing certain things. But this is a leading cause of death amongst the age group um, 15 to, to 24. And right now, the group that's actually jumping really high, subhanAllah, it's ages 7 to 14. So that's why the state of New Jersey has implemented suicide prevention workshops. And I was talking to the brother about it. Inshallah, you will have one here where you can become certified in it. So I'm giving you an overview. They're going to give you an in-depth two, two and a half hour training where you will be trained in how to prevent suicide even deeper than what I'm going in right now. All right. Any questions so far? If you have a question from the brother's side, just shout it out. Sisters, any question? Okay, let's go through some more of this stuff. So only cr crazy people have suicidal thoughts. You have to be crazy to have a suicidal thought. Myth or fact? Myth, right? We have to change how we talk about suicide and depression. Most suicide results from untreated depression. Untreated depression. Think about that. How many times have you have someone in your life, and this is where the patience comes in, right? Where someone is, is depressed and they just can't shake it off. And pray more. Get closer to Allah. This is going to help you get over it. And yes, it does. But when it's untreated, when you don't find the means to treat the depression when it goes. Now, depression, I want you all to take a minute and think about one of the saddest moments of your life. Just take a moment to think about that. Something difficult you went through. And think about how you felt at that moment. And it might have taken you maybe an hour to get over it. Maybe it took you a day. Now imagine that feeling that you had, the heaviness, the cloud over your head. Imagine you felt it when you woke up. Imagine you felt it as you went throughout your whole day. You try to avoid it, but it's just hanging over you. The heaviness is there. Then you go to sleep, only to wake up the next morning to feel the same thing over again. And imagine that happens for two weeks, to two months, to two years. That is clinical depression. That is that heavy feeling in that moment. You feel, you feel it in your body. That's how heavy the, the depression, the, the sadness is. Imagine feeling it all the time. So individuals who are suicidal, they're like, there's no way out. There's no other help. When it's untreated, there's no help. When it's treated, there is help. And we'll talk about that. Um, and untreated depression leads to higher rates of suicide. So those who attempt suicide and die by suicide, 85% of them had an undiagnosed mental illness. Undiagnosed, meaning they didn't get the intervention and help they needed. And depression treatment, statistically, if you get treatment, 60 to 80% effective. So if you go in, there's a higher chance of you getting better than you getting worse. Much higher chance. So this, this is very important to note. Um, okay, so I love this picture right here. So it says, sis, can um, this woman on the left, she goes, sister, how can you be depressed? Life is so beautiful. You have all these beautiful things around you. This is great. How can you be depressed? And the woman next to her says, sister, why do you have, how do you have asthma? You have so much air around you. How dare you have asthma? There's so much air around us and you can't breathe. 
And that's how we should look at depression too. We shouldn't say you're depressed and why are you sad? You have so much. We should look at it medically. There is a reason why the person cannot snap out of it. So just like asthma, we get treatment and we help. We all have air around us, but there's a reason why people with asthma can't breathe it in. There's also a medical reason why people with depression can't snap out of it, even though they have everything around them. So changing our mentality is really good. Okay, I think I have one or two more of these. Myth or fact, if someone wants to die, there is nothing I can do to stop them. I cannot, if they want to die, that's it. Is that a myth or a fact? Why is that a myth? The mental change can be uh, changed. Brother said something. Can you repeat that? It can be done, right? Even though somebody is thinking about it. There's a really good documentary on the Golden Gate Bridge. And this filmmaker put cameras all around the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and if anyone knows the Golden Gate Bridge, each year, 25 to 30 people a year die by suicide from jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. But more people attempt jumping. So what this filmmaker did, he was recording it. He was able to stop some people and some people he was able, he recorded um, them attempting. And the people that survived, he interviewed them. And every single one of them said, the second I jumped off that bridge, I regretted it. The second I jumped off, I said, no, why did I do this? The survivors, one of the survivors, he was in such a deep depression. He said, as soon as I jumped, I said, this is not the right thing to do. He twisted his body in such a way that he landed in the water and survived. He had many injuries, but he went on to get the help he needed. And just last year, he passed a law that they put a big net underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. So he went on from giving up on life, subhanAllah, to now saving lives. So think about someone. He, he jumped. He said, I'm done. He jumped. And then he had a moment where he said, no, I'm going to live. And subhanAllah got the treatment and is able to help other people now because now there will be a net underneath it. So if you have time, you can Google it, Golden Gate Bridge net. And you can also Google the documentary. So anyone, usually anyone who is considering, there's always a little bit of ambivalence. And that's where we come in. That's where you come in. Is that little bit of light, little bit right there. That's when you know this person can be helped. Even if they tell you there's no help, there is still a part of them that doesn't want to give up. So that is, that's your opportunity to help them get help, to ask them questions, and to get them to where they need to be. And I think this is the last one. There's all, there are almost always warning signs when someone is considering suicide. Is that a fact or a myth? Fact. You will always, if you're close enough to someone, you'll always notice some type of change where you can ask a question. So we'll get into what those are. So it is very rare, very rare for there not to be a warning sign, especially this younger generation, because you see them in school, because you see them at home, because they're around people, the younger generation, you can always notice when there's a change. And so we'll talk about what those changes are. So I want to just go over quickly some statistics, right? So in the United States, one suicide every 11 minutes and 129 people uh, die by suicide a day. All right. So this is it is a real a real issue. Now, on the next slide, I'm going to show you the United States, right? Ranked from one to 50. So I want you to is everyone here? Who here is not from New Jersey? Shout out another state that you're from. You're from here? Okay. Is anyone else lived in another state? Okay. Oregon? New York. New York. All right. So we'll get to those states. Now, between 1 and 50, 1 being the highest rate of suicide in a state and 50 being the lowest, what number do you think New Jersey is? Just shout out some numbers. Two. So you're saying it's very high. Okay. Who else? Twenty. Okay, so you're saying somewhere in the middle. So one person say suicide is very high amongst all the states. New Jersey's really high. One person said the middle. Anyone adventure and say no, suicide's not high in New Jersey. All right. Well, let's take a look. If you look at number forty-eight, the suicide rate in New Jersey is actually one of the lowest in the country. Eight point eight. Does anyone want to take a guess why that is? Social life, yes. We are a very congested state. You can walk out your house. It, from central Jersey, you can get from here to any part of New Jersey in two hours or less. We are a very congested state. 
There are a lot of people, so there's a lot of interaction, communication, talking, community. But a state like Montana, people are spread out. Have, has anyone ever heard of rural New Jersey? No, there is no rural New Jersey, but there's rural Montana. There's parts of some of these states where you can't see people for days. So the states that are more spread out and less populated, they have higher rates of depression. And also states like Alaska, where the winters are longer and colder, you have higher rates of depression. So someone said Oregon, number 14. So did someone say Oregon from the men's side? Or did I make that up? Oh, Maryland, you said Maryland. So Maryland is also one of the states that actually is not very high because it's a very congested state. But if you go to a state that's more spread out, you see higher rates and less resources there. And overall, the suicide rate is 13.9 in, in America. So we're in New Jersey, we're in a good spot, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, and that doesn't mean we don't talk about it. And the state of New Jersey has put even more effort into making sure we provide suicide prevention in religious institutions, at schools, and at other places. Okay, so let's just talk about what, what is the increased risk of suicide? What are some things that increases your risk of suicidal thoughts and feelings? So when you're around somebody, and they're going through something, look through, look at some of these risk factors so you know, hey, let me ask that question. All right, so one is change in life circumstances, right, that makes suicidal thoughts, feelings more likely. What is one big life change that every single one of us went through last year? COVID. Every single one of us dealt with COVID. Every single one of us had to stay home. We couldn't go out, go to work. There was a lot we couldn't do. So depression and suicide rates actually went up. That was a big life change. Domestic violence went up, eating disorders went up, all these things went up, um, and, and, and mainly because that was a huge life change for a lot of us, right? And in those life changes, let's see if the next one comes up, we have death of a relative. Some people lost loved ones to COVID. Some people couldn't be with our loved ones. Some people couldn't attend funerals because we were away. So that adds to this. There's separation, divorce, either divorce or other type of uh, separation and family stress. Now imagine COVID, everyone's stuck at home. There's family tension on top of that. So that adds to all the things that affect our mental health and that for some people led them to higher rates of suicide, led them to think about it even if they probably didn't. And then loss of employment, status, self-esteem. So all these things occurred during COVID, which makes sense as to why the suicide rates went up, right? Um, but in general, even if we weren't in COVID, anyone that you're around that you see going through things like this, it's important to kind of just check in on them. Just check in. Um, sister, I see you taking pictures. I'm actually going to give this uh, PowerPoint to the brother. So inshallah, brother, if you could share. Yeah, perfect. Yes, question. Or not, or there's yeah. a reason. What is the reason that some people, for some people, the, whatever the stress is, it just doesn't seem to go away? Sleep doesn't help. Time yeah. Time doesn't help. So the brother asks, well, what when someone has depression or something heavy that they're dealing with and a good night's sleep doesn't just get rid of it, what is the reason for that? Some people are predisposed to higher risk of depression genetically. Some people have harder life circumstances and their coping mechanism doesn't work. There's trauma that changes how your brain functions. So all these different factors lead for some people not to get over it. So I know somebody who had a very tragic death. They had a sibling who died in a very tragic way. Now this person couldn't talk to anyone about it because nobody in their life ever lost a sibling that way. So this person, as much as they would try to talk about it, anything anyone said to them would make it worse right? Their, their parent went into dis, uh, depression and this person themselves. So it went from grief, grief lasts up to 30 days, to complicated grief. That's when depression and everything else ensued. So those are 
mitigating factors. So there's also other factors they have to look into that sometimes a good night's sleep doesn't just get rid of it. And certain traumas, when you look at refugees and certain things that they have gone through, their levels of depression and anxiety might be higher. And if they don't deal with it, you'll notice, have you ever noticed a family that's very anxious? And then they have a child that's anxious. And then their other child's anxious. It's called generational trauma. You're generationally also passing things down. So if your family, you have depression in your family, you've never sought help for it then that kind of passes on to the next level as well too. So having a medical model and having certain interventions and being okay, making therapy normal. And therapy doesn't mean things are bad and you need to go to someone. It just means let's see where you are. Let's go to someone who has not a biased opinion and let's talk to them and honor what you're going through. And when you honor what you're going through, you can then get through it. Doesn't mean something's wrong with you when you go to help get help for mental health. I had a, a family where the child reached out to me panic attacks every day, every single day panic attack. And the panic attack was heart palpitations, headaches. So where did the parents take them? To a cardiologist. Where did the parents take them? Neurologist. Everything came back fine. And when the child ended up calling me, I said, this, this sounds like a panic attack. How many days a week do you, oh, every day of the week. And how, how long does it last? It could last up to an hour. So I had a conversation with, the, it was a very difficult conversation to say, you know what? Let's try a psychiatrist. No, 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 no. No medication for my, no, my child's not crazy. I said, no, your child is suffering. They're not crazy. They're suffering. So let's, let's give it a try. So step by step, we went to a therapist. We went to a psychiatrist. The child was put on medication, but doesn't mean they're going to be on it forever. The child calls me back and says, I, I've never felt like this. I don't know the last time I felt like I can breathe again. But the parent said, Shima, they're still on the medication. Their obsession was the medication they were on as opposed to their child feeling a lot better. Now, over time, we come to find out that the parents also needed certain levels of therapy and also had anxiety. And now, alhamdulillah, the entire family is now embracing that I can take medication and feel better, just like for a headache. And it doesn't have to be forever. Because once I have a better mindset, then the therapies that I do will actually stick and I won't need the medication anymore. So any, any other questions before I move on? Yes. Yeah. In the heart. So you're saying, yeah. And what I want to argue is like, yes, if the heart is clean, the brain is clean. But let's say the pre with depression, it's not the heart that's suffering. It's the brain that's malfunctioning. So you're right. The closer we are to Allah, and we pray, like, just like if you have cancer, you pray for shifa, right? Just like you have any illness, we pray for shifa. That's how we look at mental illness, too. We pray for shifa. And if that shifa comes in the form of medication, treatment, I understand, you know, the depression, we do. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. So that's you, you make a very good point. Like you during COVID, you were able to handle it, but you couldn't understand why other people couldn't handle it. And that's the point with this complaining. And we have to look at what they're saying if it's complaining, or we have to hear what they're really saying. The sister here said everyone's situation is different, right? How we approach things. There are things that people are going through in their homes that they don't share, right? Alhamdulillah, your mindset could change because you had the space where it, you had a healthy space where you could, we could change the mindset. And for some people, it works. 
changing mindset. But when it's clinical depression, where suicide comes in, it goes to a medical. There's no necessarily, and then the brother who's going to do the second half of this, I'm sure will be able to speak on it a little deeper than, than I am, is that, yes, a closeness to Allah is, is important. And how many people are close to Allah and still get cancer? How many people, there's different types of illnesses we have, and we have to look at mental illness in the same way. Certain depression, if you're feeling sad, I agree with you. Because getting closer to Allah will help you. Even if you have major depression, getting closer to Allah will help you. But Allah also gives us the means to seek out treatment to get better. So I believe you. Mindset. Yeah. You have good coping mechanisms. You use different coping mechanisms. Yeah. Agreed. If you're upset and you're complaining and you're not taking action, you're not helping your own cause. I agree with you. Same thing if you're sick and you're not getting the help for it, you're not helping yourself. People who are overweight and complain about the weight but don't do anything about it, why are you complaining? I, I under, completely understand what you're saying is take action. Bad news, what you see on TV. Yeah. You're right. You want to take yourself out of certain situations that add to the 100%. If you're in an environment that's making you sick, you want to get yourself, I agree with you, you want to get yourself out of that, that environment. So we'll get back to that in a second, too. You make some very good points. Very good points. Uh, moving right along, there's also changes in the health status. So, you know, health and, and family members, these type of things impact and can add to suicidal thoughts. Any questions about the things that may affect someone having a higher chance of suicidal thoughts before we get into warning signs? Yeah. It's a medical condition. And depression, depending on how long you're dealing with it, can manifest into uh, medical, medical concerns as well, too. Um, but depression is you can have physical symptoms of depression. And we'll talk about what some of these symptoms are, like um, it affects your sleep, it affects your eating, it affects a lot of things that affect your physical health. It is a mental illness, but it's treated in a medical model. Did that answer your question? How you diagnose it. Yes. So um, the way you diagnose is when you do go to a, a psychiatrist, they use the DSM. And the DSM is a diagnostic manual for um, specifically different types of mental illnesses. And then based on that, if you go to a good psychiatrist, they don't just throw medication at you. So for example, Dr. Uh, Arshad Siddiqui is a, a psychiatrist I work with a lot. Um, you want to go to a psychiatrist who talks to you and sees where you are. Right? If you're hesitant on taking medication, someone who hears you say that, but also works with you to figure out what is going to be good for you. Right? So when you start medication, any type, physical or for your mental health, after two weeks, they come back and assess, did it work, what's working, what's not, and then, then we go from there. But yes, we do use a medical model for diagnosing uh, mental illness. Any other question? So what are, the, what are the warning signs? So these are very important warning signs that you see in people, right? So you, you see drastic changes. So if you are working with a student, or you're teaching at this school or another school, you have a child, and you start to see changes in how they're doing academically, their grades start going down, someone at work is having work, bad performance, or just daily is not doing what they usually do, they may be depressed. They may be having suicidal thoughts. There may be, if there's a preoccupation with death or dying. I was working with a family, um, whose child verbally said, I, I don't want to live it. I don't want to live anymore. I just don't want to live. And the family's response is, oh, God, she's being dramatic. She must, she's just being dramatic. Until that child one day then had a plan. And then we were able to intercept her before she was able to do anything drastic and get her the help she needs. But their first response was when they started noticing she's not doing good in school, her concentration went down, she had lost of interest. She was an athlete. She stopped playing all these sports. And the, all the examples I'm giving you are Muslim families I work with. So um, 
you know, she made statements about not wanting to live anymore and then experiencing like humiliating, getting easily humiliated in front of people. These are all warning signs. Does that mean you jump in and say, hey, you're going to kill yourself? No, that's not how you approach it. Right. When you notice these differences, we're going to talk about how to then ask questions that could be more direct or indirect in trying to get uh, what's happening. So you'll start to see changes in an individual and start to hear them say things. You'll see them a change in their mood. They'll have low mood or agitation. If you know someone who's easily agitated, this is who they are. That doesn't mean they're suicidal. That's if they're a nor if they're not usually an agitated person and then you start to see them get agitated and they're changed in their behavior, in their mood. That's when you start to say, hey, what's going on? Depression, like I said, if you see someone who's depressed, and not just they say, talk, have one conversation with you, they're depressed, but one week, two week, three week, their, their thought isn't changing, that is somebody you want to check on. Um, and they express thoughts of, of feelings and hopelessness. Some people don't say, I want to die. Some people say, oh, it's not worth it. Anything I do just doesn't work out. You know, everything in life is just bad. Nothing is going my way. That's what hopelessness sounds like. That's what helplessness. And then you give them a suggestion. They come to you and then you give them the best suggestion and then they still, no. Nothing's going to work out for me anyways. They may be depressed. They may be hopeless. That, that, it, it can look like that. It doesn't have to sound like, hey, I want to kill myself. Hey, I'm going to end my life. It may be something more subtle in that way. And then the inability to concentrate. So when you have suicidal thoughts, when you have depressed, your concentration is one thing that majorly, your cognitive abilities majorly get affected by that. I do want to leave time for questions, but one second. And then when you see people behaving recklessly and feeling trapped. So this is big, behaving recklessly amongst um, high school and college age children. I had a family I was working with, and the child was doing very risky behavior, very risky. And the parents were like, oh, this is just teenage angst. And I said, mm, let's revisit that. And we came to find out that the child ended up having um, diagnosis of bipolar, which was leading to de uh, depression and suicidal thoughts. Um, but we, alhamdulillah, were able to get him the help. So when you see someone behaving recklessly, once, okay, we address it. It happens twice. It happens three times. It happens over and over again. That is something we need to look at because that is a sign of someone who may be suicidal. Um, their, their sleep and their diet pattern changes. You see an increase in weight or loss of weight. They sleep too much. They sleep too little. They may start abusing substances. They start giving away personal items. They, they're not attached to anything anymore. When you see someone start stop getting attached to things, it's important to start asking the question, are you okay? And they start to withdraw from friends and family. They stop going out to gatherings. You have hangouts. You don't see them. Every time you invite them, they don't come. Give them a call. Give them a call. Ask them what's going on. And then finally, you see drastic changes in their personal appearance. That is something more direct. So now how can you help? Well, any questions before I move on to how you can help? Any questions about some of the changes, I warning signs? All right, so this is where you come in. So you've looked at things, you've seen things, you're looking at warning, what can I do? So first thing is talk. So most people who have suicidal thoughts experience like, you know, an ambivalence. They don't want to really do it and are likely to seek out help from someone that they see as caring, someone who's not going to judge them. So it's important when you approach somebody, how you approach them. The other thing is not be judgmental. Don't debate. Don't lecture. Don't tell them what to do. Just hear them. Hear them. And then say, let's figure out how we can get you help. Because if you say to them, you know, you're sad. it's your own fault you're sad. It's your own fault. Which sometimes someone who is depressed, it's not going to help them. It's going to actually make them feel worse. God, she's right. I'm, 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 what's wrong with me? And it makes them feel even worse. and makes them feel like they, they can't get the help they need. Don't minimize or shame them. So if someone tells you something serious, like they're having a thought, don't try to convince them not to have the thought. Don't say, no, 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 no. You're not suicidal. No, 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 no. No, that's not what you really mean. Okay, let's, what you really mean is, or like the family that's like, the, the child actually said, I want to end my life. You're being dramatic. That is minimizing. And that brings shame to that person. They, they, I'm feeling bad. Maybe it's, I'm wrong for feeling bad. Maybe I should, I should follow through with this. Um, don't act, try not to act shocked. So I'm trained when someone says they want to end their life. They tell me how they're going to do it, when they're going to do it. I know how not to be shocked. But when someone tells you, be very aware of what's going on for you um, when someone tells you that they're down and, and they're feeling a certain way. And never, ever, 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 ever promise to keep it a secret, please. They say, I'm confiding in you. 
It doesn't mean you're breaking their promise, but if someone says something about suicide or wanting to end their lives, keep any other promises you want. But when they're talking about suicide and ending their life, make sure you talk to a professional, and I'm going to give you some phone numbers and places that you can call to say, hey, this is what my friend said, what can I do? Make sure you talk to someone that you're not holding that secret. Because if the inevitable happened, that, that secret's going to kill you on the inside. I knew. They did say something. I could have gotten them the help they needed. Um, take the warning signs seriously. I'm going to go to the next page. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how to, what questions to ask and what questions not to ask and take action. So we're going to talk about questions and take action, right? Um, so to ask direct questions. So these are some questions you can ask, right? If someone is suicidal, you can, you can either directly say, hey, listen, you've told me a lot. Are, are, you, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Are you thinking about killing yourself? Or, you know, when people are upset, like you seem, or people are going through what, you, what you're going through, sometimes they think about, they kind of wish that they were dead. So I'm wondering if you feel that way too. Have you had those thoughts? And if they say yes, you say, have you thought about how you're going to do it? So asking that question is not putting the idea in their head. They're going to say no. If they say yes, you say, whoa, have you ever acted on it? If they say, I'm thinking about it, that's when you get that really, really reach out for help immediately. And we're going to talk about that. And then you can directly say, are you thinking about killing yourself? It's okay to ask these questions. You're not giving them ideas. I promise you, you're not giving them ideas. It's, it's you're actually saying to them, listen, I hear you. I want you to talk about it. I want you to tell me. I'm here for you. What you don't want to ask is, you're not thinking about killing yourself, are you? Why is that a bad way to ask a question? Does anyone want to tell me why that, why you shouldn't ask it that way? You're degrading what they're feeling, right? You're not thinking that. That's, or you wouldn't do something stupid, would you? Come on. And that makes a person feel even worse. Like, damn, I, not only do I want to end my life, but now I've, God, they're judging me. Suicide is a dumb idea. Surely you're not thinking about suicide, right? You're thinking about suicide, that means you're not close to Allah. They may be very close and still suffering because it is a mental illness, right? So you want to be very careful how you ask the question. And, and you can ask, say the same thing, but ask in a very different way. So the, in these questions right here. So I want to do like a quick two-minute activity. Just a quick two-minute activity. I want you to pair up. I'm going to time it because I know we have to pray salah. It's going to literally, I'm going to do one-minute activity. So find a partner. And you're going to ask the person next to you one of these questions here. Some of you may have never asked this question. These words may have never come out of your mouth. I want you to see what it feels like to say one of these questions to the person next to you. And then you switch. After 30 seconds, I'm going to say 30 seconds are over, you switch. And then the other person asks the question. So the one person is pretending like they're down and depressed, and you keep asking them, and then the other person asks the questions about suicide. All right? So we're going to start now, and when I say 30 seconds are over, we're going to switch partners. Does everyone have a partner? So take a minute to move around. I want you to see what it feels like to ask these questions. If you've never asked this question before, it's very interesting. All right, ready? Go. Okay, let's switch partners. Now, other way. If you didn't ask the question, now you're asking the question and the other person's answering it.
Okay, time's up. Time's up. Can I ask a question? Has anyone ever asked anyone? Just raise your hand or shout it out. Have you ever asked anyone this question in your real life? We have one, one or two brothers, sisters. Have you ever had anyone? So what did it feel like asking this question? It was odd. I mean, you're asking someone who may not be suicidal. What was it like asking this question? Very uncomfortable, right? It was very uncomfortable. Anyone else? So it is not a comfortable question to ask. But the more we think about it, the more we ask people, the more we can end up helping them. So that's why we want to normalize this conversation. We want to normalize this discussion. We want to normalize this question. So that asking someone it is uncomfortable. Even me, even me as a professional, sometimes when I ask someone, it's how do I ask it? It's not a quest, comfortable question to ask. So I wanted to do that exercise just as, as an illustration of, yes, saying it sometimes is not easy, but saying it can actually save a life. So how can you save a life? Yeah. Yes, depending on how honest you, they are with you. Also depends on the level of trust. The le They might be in denial. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. All these factors play into it. But the more you open space for them to think, because if they're in denial, they're not going to do it. If they're not in denial, trust me, they're going to act on it. But you're absolutely right. But creating space to talk about it, creating a community that's open to talking about it will make more people comfortable to say, yeah, I'm not that confused. And sure. Yeah. A lot of pressure, yes. No. Accusing, yeah. So, so that wouldn't be a place where that person would feel comfortable opening up. Yeah. Depression, pressure. Uh, parents getting angry, upset, making kids feel bad. They're not going to go to you then to talk. But it's important that they have a place to talk. So the masjid, having this conversation about suicide in the masjid is very important. Very important because then this can be the space that people go to to talk about this. Now these resources, this you can take a picture of. Please take a picture of the screen. This is very, very, very important. Is the Suicide Prevention Lifeline is the national hotline. And the one next to it is New Jersey only. New Jersey went out of their way to say, no, we're going to do our own hotline. So let's say you're talking to someone who's suicidal and you're like, oh, my God, what do I do next? You can actually pick up the phone and call this number and said, this is what the person said to me. This is what's going on. And they'll walk you through how to help them. Or if you're someone who is suicidal, you have nowhere to turn. You can't turn to your parents. You can't turn to the community. You can turn here. You have trained professionals who will talk to you. The good thing about this, they can actually trace where you are. Um, or kind of figure out where you are. So if you are someone who's going to act on it, they can send help right away. So this is an important number to give to people in your life, and it's an important number for you to have as well. So alhamdulillah, that's all I have to say about that right now. Is there, do we have time for questions? Or We have five minutes for questions. Any, if you have a question, just shout it, or can you point to whoever? It is? Okay. Yeah. That's a great question. If someone is not even having suicidal thoughts yet and you ask them this question, it's going to make them think about it. I can tell you that's usually not the case. If they're not thinking about it, they're not going to do it. But if they're already thinking about it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't open a door. Hey, you didn't think about this. Why don't you go down this door? Because suicide is death. Suicide is a very serious thing. Um, so I can tell you statistically, I can tell you the research backs all of this up, that asking the question, even if the person is not suicidal, doesn't give them the idea or give the encourages them to do it. That we in our field know is not, in fact, not asking the question, even if someone is not even at that stage, yet, not asking the question can leave the door open for them to even think about it. Because once they start thinking about it and you haven't preempted them and they're already and they get to that point where they start to think about it, then we're, we're losing them even more. 
But I think that's a very good point that you do make because that is something to think about, right? If I if they weren't thinking about it, then why did I mention it? You mentioning it will never ever be the reason why they started to think about it. Yes. Yes. So is there any empirical evidence where, you know, suicide, you said it has a disclaimer between races and yes. regions and ethnicities, right? But is there any uh, evidence that comes through where you look at it and say it was the expectations of the parents of that place that plays a very different critical role? Yeah. So in, in households where, and there is evidence where there is a lot of pressure and no support, you do have higher rates of attempts or higher rates of thoughts. The success rate of it might not be as high, but the attempts are, are pretty high in environments where there isn't support. So some parents add the pressure, but that child may have support in a teacher. They may have a support in another thing. But if the child has pressure and then no support, this is why suicidal, suicide rates were so high during COVID, is because they didn't have their teachers. They didn't have their peers. They didn't have the other places where they can go dump. They were just stuck in the place that was causing the tension and depression. So yes, there is, there is data that supports that. But if you don't have a support system outside of the pressure, you at, are at a much higher risk of attempting. A sister in the back, yes. That's a really good, oh my God, good question. If somebody says, you ask them the question, are you suicidal? They say, yes. Can I ask why? Why do, why do you want to kill yourself? Any idea? Is that a good question or a bad question? Is why a good question? Why sounds very judgmental. So you want to be careful. There's a way to ask why. Instead of saying, well, why do you want to kill yourself? You could say, oh, I wonder what's going on in your life. What's going on? Rather than say why, because when you say why, when someone says to me, and I'm like, I'm not hungry, I don't want to eat, why don't you want to eat? That just bothers me. I think about any time someone's asked you why, you're like, why do I have to explain myself? Why is makes a person defensive. But if you want to get to the why, you can ask it in a different way. What's going on? I wonder what's going on. Do you mind telling me? You're asking the same, you're asking why, right? But you're not asking by using that one word. It's a very good question. But, oh, yes. And as it goes, we, we do have to.
So uh, we have the go-to uh, dinner boxes for everyone. So inshallah, that's the plan, and I'll turn it over to Brother Mubeen. Jazakumullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbi ajma'in. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri. Wa alul uqdatan min lisani yafqaw qawli. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Let's thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this invitation to Islam. for having the courage, the strength of Iman to address the gorilla of all topics, suicide. The courage and the strength of Iman to address this topic. And by addressing this topic, the community is saying to us, it will not allow Allah's rules to be swept under the carpet. It will not allow Allah's rules to be put on the back burner. Allah's commands. What are these commands pertinent to suicide? وَلَا تُلْقُوا بِأَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَى التَّحْلُكَ And do not throw yourselves with your own hands into destruction. Very clear and direct command. Wala taktulu anfusakum, and do not kill yourselves. So this community is telling us they will not allow those sort of commands to be swept under the carpet. We will talk about them by addressing this topic. This community tells us that we have a job to do. What is that job? وَأَمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَنْهَا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ Enjoin what is right and just, forbid what is wrong. This topic is saying all these things. Yes, this community desires for their brothers and for their sisters what they desire for themselves. Jannah. And most important of all, this community wants to dismantle the stigma associated with mental health issues. They want to dismantle this. That's why they brought this topic. That is why we are here. Now let's focus on the gorilla in the room, the sacrifice issue. Before Salah, Sister Shima Majiduddin very eloquently gave us a tour, a beautiful tour of all the implications of mental health. How deep it is, how wide it is, its impact on society, on the community, on the family. Beautiful tour, mashallah, jazakumullah. Thoughts of ending one's life are a symptom of a much, much bigger problem. They are a symptom of ment a mental health crisis. This mental health crisis is caused by a combination of the following invasions. The mind is invaded by several invaders. What are some of these? Depression? PTSD, hopelessness, work pressures, isolation, loneliness, social pressures, financial pressures, failed relationships, 
Islamophobia, bullying, religious discrimination, drugs, the, rule, the, the list goes on and on and on. So it's a, all of these working in any combination invading the mind. Yes, to think of ending one's life is a mental health crisis, just like a heart attack is a blood circulation crisis. When I have a heart attack, they call 911. They make dua for me. Nobody says I'm a bad Muslim. If I have a heart attack, you will make dua for me. It's a circ blood circulation crisis. The same as a mental health crisis leads to thoughts of suicide. How can I be a bad Muslim when I have a mental health crisis? We have to dislodge ourselves from that shallow way of thinking. When I have high blood pressure or I have diabetes, they send me to a medical professional. No one says, sorry, brother. This is as a result of all the poor choices you made through your life. Nobody says that. They give me blood pressure medication. And everybody makes dua for me. My respected Muslims, my respected brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters who experience a mental health crisis need professional help. They don't need our criticism. In fact, we need to go an extra mile. We need to facilitate that professional help. Why? Why? Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَا النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا If we save one life, it's as if we've saved all of humanity. So that broad thinking is part of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's lessons that he taught us. We have to think outside the box. Now here's the deal. Let's hit this disease, this mental health crisis with everything we've got. Let's use the help of our professional therapists. Let's use them. And let's be sure to use the survival tools taught to us in Islam. What survival tools do I carry in my Islamic toolkit? Let's take a look inside. What survival tools do I have to combat the suggestions of shaitan? Number one. Cultivate a winner's attitude as distinct from a loser's attitude. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had impeccable credentials. They came from Allah. He wrote Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's resume. These credentials did not come from an Ivy League school. They did not come from Yale, Princeton. They came from Allah. What are some of these credentials? وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We sent you not but as a mercy to all creatures. وَإِنَّكَ لَأَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ You have the highest standard of character. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا you have indeed in the Apostle of Allah a beautiful pattern of conduct. Whoever obeys Rasulullah obeys Allah. Those are his credentials. But despite this, despite these excellent credentials, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to weather test after test. Allah repeatedly drew attention to his universal testing strategy. What's that? 
ahasiban nasu ayutraku ayaqulu amanna wa hum la yuftanun do men think that they will be left alone on saying we believe and we will not be tested rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was tested why do you and i expect to have a free pass why do you and i expect to have an easy pass in fact we should be concerned when the turbulence stops that's a winner's attitude when the turbulence stops when everything gets very quiet we should be concerned that is a winner's attitude when rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was in sujood and they threw unclean camels intestines onto him he said to his grieving daughter oh fatima have no fear allah will make islam victorious that is a winner's attitude when he was set upon at uhud surrounded being beaten he reached out to allah rabbi ighfir li qaumi fa innahum la ya'lamun oh allah forgive my people for they do not know this is a winner's attitude a winner's attitude is the antidote that neutralizes hopelessness we have to cultivate a winner's attitude we have to go to our therapists we have to go to our psychiatrists our psychologists but we have to cultivate a winner's attitude otherwise we are losers on all fronts number 2 do your spiritual push-ups build spiritual muscle what are spiritual push-ups respect for life that's a spiritual push-up salah love for parents giving with your right hand whilst concealing it from your left these are spiritual push-ups and that's what builds spiritual muscle is the evidence of spiritual muscle in action sure there is here are a few examples when bani israel and musa alay salam were leaving egypt and firaun followed them with his state of the art army the moment bani israel saw the approaching army and began to sing the song of surrender what was that inna la mudrakun we will certainly be overtaken musa alay salam did not run for the first exit he stood his ground because he had spiritual muscle what did he say qala kalla inna ma'ya rabbi sayahdi never my lord is with me soon shall he guide me you see spiritual muscle reinforced by the attendance of therapists and all the other medications that we can take but we have to couple these abu bakr may allah be pleased with him and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam are taking refuge in the cave of mount tur and the pagans enter and are looking for them and abu bakr may allah be pleased with him whisper whispers to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam o prophet of allah if they look down they will be able to see us through the crevices in the floor rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says to him o abu bakr what do you think of two with whom the third is allah spiritual muscle you see that's what we need to navigate this life irrespective of your circumstances we need spiritual muscle when ibrahim alayhi salam was thrown into the giant inferno by the pagans he insulated himself from the panic of the moment with one focus hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil sufficient is allah the best disposer of affairs so to navigate this life to challenge and face up to the problems that we have 
the hopelessness, the struggles. We need spiritual muscle. Number three, the number to dial when your life is in danger is 911. What number do you dial when your soul is in danger? 1-800-REPENTANCE. That's the number to dial when your soul is in danger. Yunus alayhi salam dialed this number from the darkness of the whale's tummy. Fanada fi dhulumati Allah ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu minad zalimin. And he cried through the depths of darkness, there is no God but you. I was indeed wrong. He dialed this number in his moment of need. Hawa, may Allah be pleased with her. And Adam alayhi salam dialed this number from the shade of shaitan's treachery. Rabbana zalamna anfusana wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lana kunanna min al khasirin. Oh Allah, we have wronged our souls. If you do not have mercy on us, if you do not forgive us, we will certainly be lost. This is, these are the tools we have. In addition to every other tool we can use that is available in this life. Musa alayhi salam dialed this number as a refugee in Madian. He was a refugee, helpless. Rabbi inna lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqir. Oh my Lord, truly I am in desperate need of anything that you can send me, any good you can send me. And of course, in every one of these instances, the line was not busy. Allah accepted the call. So we have these acts, we have this access. When there's hopelessness, when there's a feeling of defeat, when we are being submerged in depression, here are the tools we have. But we have to reinforce these tools with what is available in this life. When Rasulullah had a pain or he needed cupping or he needed some medication, whatever was available, they used it. He didn't say, I'm just going to sit and make dua. That's not the deal. Number four, let's eavesdrop upon the conversation of husband and wife. Let's listen to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talking to Aisha, his wife. Oh Aisha, love the poor and let them come to you. Allah will draw you near to himself. Reading this hadith is like taking a dose of emotional soothing, an emotional soothing agent. Why do I say this? I say this because when I serve others who have bigger problems, my problems appear progressively smaller. And my problems recede into the background. In other words, serving the poor displaces negative mental energy and replaces it with positive mental energy, which is gratitude. We have these tools. We have to be using them. We cannot be reverting to just one line of attack. Number five, this is perhaps the most important one for us parents. A parent has to actively level the playing field in this confusing world. We have to level the playing field. We cannot be making unrealistic demands of our children. We cannot be forcing them to live the lives that we aspired to have but did not succeed in. I needed to be a doctor. Therefore, my children will be doctors. We cannot. We have to level the playing field. Let them live their lives. An A-plus parent leads by example because he knows that every one of his movements is under the microscope. 
So I can't just be pointing fingers at my children. I have to lead by example. And Allah says this beautifully. Allah says, وَالْبَلَدُ الْتَيِّبُ يَخْرُجُوا نَبَاتُهُ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّي وَالَّذِي خَبُثَ لَا يَخْرُجُوا إِلَّا نَكِدًا From the land that is good and fertile springs up rich product after its kind. But from the land that is miserable and infertile springs up only that which is miserly. We set the pace as parents. We have got to be watching and leveling the playing field all the time. Am I surprised when suddenly my son is thinking suicide? I haven't been paying enough attention. He's not the bad Muslim, maybe it's me. See, these tough questions have to be asked. And I've got to stand up and answer them. An A-plus parent encourages academic excellence, but also frequently draws attention to the job, dis the job description of Allah's vicegerent on this earth. Sure, he, draw, he wants academic excellence, but he has to level the playing field by illustrating what the job description of Allah's vicegerent on this earth is. And what is that? What is our job description? Ya Bunaya, Aqimi Salata, Wa'mur bil Ma'rufi, Wanha anil Mulkari, Wasbil Alama Asabak. Oh, my son, establish regular salah. Enjoin what is right, forbid what is wrong, and bear with patience whatever whatever you experience. The parent has got to be doing this all the time, not waiting till the child is at college. So we have contributed to this problem in many ways. An A-plus parent is an exercise fanatic. He's always energizing his children to become graduates in the martial arts. That's me. But he is also an instructor when it comes to self-defense against shaitan. You've got to be a man who is energetic. You've got to be pushing them to do exercise, yes. But you've got to be an instructor against shaitan. And how's that? Allah says, وَإِمَّا يَنْزَغَنَّكَ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ نَزْغٌ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ and if at any time the evil one invites you towards evil, seek refuge in Allah, for he's the one who knows and hears all. And this is our job. This is what parents have to do. And if we haven't done this, don't be surprised by the end result when we want him or her to live the life that we haven't been able to live. How can shaitan take me by the hand when I am using both hands to hold on to the rope of Allah? Parents have got to be demanding academic excellence, I agree. But these are dinner table discussions which they have to have as well. Then the field is level. Then the playing field is level. Otherwise, it's undulating in one direction. Number six, the tools we have in our toolbox we're talking about. Make yourself accessible. Get down from your ivory tower. Once, a very young person, new to the Muslim community, came to visit Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Very young person. And this person was awestruck. He's coming to visit the Prophet of Allah the leader of the Muslims, a person respected by everyone. And he was anxious and he was obviously, he showed this in his, in his body language. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw this, he said to him, young man, relax and be at ease. I'm not a king or a monarch. I'm just the son of a lady 
who ate cured meat. What do we learn from this? What do we learn from this encounter? Don't leave young blood knocking at the door. Fling open the doors. Invite them in. Young people, they come with a gust of energy. They question the status quo. They are not afraid to ask questions. And their energy can be infectious. You can begin to feel a lot younger as well. But more importantly, here's the thing. When young people see that you are accessible, that you are approachable, that you are genuine, that you are a reinforcer rather than a fault finder, they might ask you for help. We've got to make ourselves accessible. Get down from the ivory tower and talk and look the person in the eye. That's what Dr. Seema was talking about. You have to be accessible. Ask the questions. And when they see that you are genuine, that you are not judging them, they'll ask for help. That's our job. Or else we are at fault as well. I am at fault. Conclusion. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Every day, each of us needs to recalibrate, reassert our obedience to Allah. And how do we do this? We should fast forward to the day of account and get a sneak preview of shaitan's final speech of deception. This is amazing. In the Quran, the shaitan's final speech of deception. And this is a daily recalibration we should all experience. This is Surah 14, verse 22. And here's what shaitan says on that day. وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُدِيَ الْأَمْرُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعَدَ الْحَقِّ وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ And shaitan will say when the matter has been decided, it was Allah who gave you a promise of truth. I too promised, but I failed in my promise to you. وَمَا كَانَ لِيَا عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُهُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي I had no authority over you except to call you. Then reproach me not, but reproach your own souls. I cannot listen to your cries, nor should you listen to mine. What kind of person reads these this final desertion, this final message of desertion, and still follow shaitan, the most unfortunate person, the person that you and I let slip. That's the person that follows this sort of, that ignores this final speech of deception. The person that we allowed to fall because we did not understand the problem. My respected Muslims, when I have a headache, I take a tablet. When I am overweight, I join the weightlifters club. I go to the gym. When I have a mental problem, I should do something about it. If I'm not, I am denying the rules of Islam. Don't, let, don't destroy yourself with your own hands. I'm ignoring all the symptoms when they are looking right at me right in the eye. And as parents, we are on the ivory tower and not making ourselves accessible enough. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to ask tough questions, to scrutinize our behavior before we look at others and call them bad Muslims. Because that is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never did. Even the pagans, he treated them like potential believers. 
How can we look down on someone who is having a problem? Having a mental heart attack. How can we look down on such a person? How can I let him go? How can I ignore his appeal for help? Oh Allah, open our hearts, open our minds. Let us accept that saving one person is like saving humanity. Jazakumullah khair. I think we're a little bit short, but uh, good time for questions. Jazakumullah khair, Brother Mubeen. Um, what, what, what we like to do right now, alhamdulillah, we have about half an hour. Sister Shima is with us. Um, really open it up for questions. Please avail yourself of this opportunity of having um, a licensed therapist with so much experience and Brother Mubin here and, um, and really ask questions. What can we do? I'll start off. Um, Sister Shima, this question is for you. Um, what have you seen or what would you recommend centers and communities doing at a communal level? Um, here, you know, we have, uh, mashallah, the, the, the masjid, as well as a full-time school, um, multiple, not just a, a school, but, you know, uh, weekend classes, uh, uh, people who want to send their kids outside of Islamic school, just uh, supplement that. Uh, we have a, mashallah, community, right? What do you see? Uh, communities, what can be done? What are some of the steps that we should be thinking about? Jazakallah khair. An, an amazing talk, brother. Thank you so much. Um, one thing that we can do, and it, it goes to what was just spoken about, is, is fighting that stigma. And we can do that in many ways in our community. One is if you're a teacher or you have these Islam, Islamic centers and these programs, is make discussion, checking in, mental health, just a normal topic. Start each program with how is everyone doing today and really delve deep into what that means. Start off the discussion with where are we? Where is your mind? Where is your heart? Openly talk about it and let it be okay fighting that stigma that it's okay to have more difficult conversation. If someone's not feeling good, tell me more about that. And having open discussions around that. So even starting programs and starting different things with that, it lets others know that it's okay to talk about it here and I won't be judged. Um, what we're doing today is a great start to that. What we're doing today and saying that we can have these difficult conversations is very important. But having check-ins and having uh, fighting that stigma and letting people know and normalizing talk, normalizing therapy, normalizing getting help, knowing that it's a part of our dean to do that is the first step in making sure that this is something that we continue doing as we move forward. So we have India. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, good. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Being a parent, I would like to know what are the signs of this kind of feeling in the kids and how to recognize it and how to rectify it. Uh, one thing is that, of course, uh, to uh, recognize that they have a problem. And what are the signs? The second thing is that uh, as a parent, we need to also learn uh, how to interact and overcome this problem. So I'll give that to Sister Shima. In part one, we went through that. And Alhamdulillah, she's going to make, she's going to make the, uh, the, uh, the presentation that we use. That's going to be public, so we'll share that. But I'll just let Sister Shima answer that. Yeah, so we'll share on the slide. The main thing is to know drastic changes in your child. So what was normal for them, and then they start to act differently. They're isolating. They're staying away from friends and family. Um, their emotions are going high and low. And in that process, I want to tell every parent, check in with yourself too. This is not an easy thing to do is see your child going through something. And if you don't check in with yourself and say, okay, how am I handling this? you may add more of the stress on for yourself and for your child. Um, so yeah, noticing drastic changes, noticing them, they're saying things, noticing that they're giving away some of their things. Um, but more importantly, the more they're isolated and the less that they're talking to people, the more you should try to get them to engage. Now, if they snap at you and they don't want to talk to you, maybe talk to one of their friends or someone they feel comfortable with to kind of get in there and have that conversation. But in this whole process, I always tell parents, please, please check in with yourself too. 
it's not just about your child because the patients and is, is your patients as well too, that is, is being affected. The whole house gets affected. So checking in with yourself is just as important as checking in with your child. Also, a change that we can note is that a loss of interest in the religion itself. I'm not doing Salah with the same enthusiasm. I'm not looking forward to Ramadan with the same momentum that I used to. This prompts us to make judgments about them, but we should look deeper. What is the, this, what's discouraging him or her? What is demotivating him? Is it the environment in the school? Is it, a, is it unfriendly? Is it bullying? But all of this we have to look at. Just the moment somebody doesn't want to do salah with enthusiasm, we say, are oh, you bad? School is doing you bad. We make shallow judgments. I ask myself all the time, do not make shallow judgments. Rather, how am I contributing to the problem? What am I doing? Am I trying to make my child live a life that I did not live? I'm forcing the same standards on the child which are unrealistic. Remember, some of us have been in high school 40 years ago, 30 years ago. We don't know what it is to be in a high school today. Therefore, do not judge today's kids by standards that are 30 or 40 years old. We have to talk to the professionals. We have to look at their knowledge that is based on today's standards. And that's not bad because we are questioning ourselves. But I find that sometimes they stop greeting. Even a small thing like that, I've got to keep reminding them to greet. And the fact is there's a dislocation. And that dislocation can be because of several mental issues that are crowding the whole environment at that moment. Wow, don't make shallow judgments. That's a that's important. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. unfortunately I also missed the first part, so my question was similar to Brother uh Hamid Hussaini's. Um but what are the signs? Are the signs different with adults? Because uh, I know we're talking about kids, but what about adults? They go through the same uh feelings, or is there any specific signs that we know in adults? And the other thing was, are there any masnoon du'as that you can remind us of that we can encourage people to recite or make? So I'd urge, um, what we'll do is we'll put up that presentation because alhamdulillah, the sister went through it uh, one by one um, and we'll share it with the community, but I'll let her again address. Thank you, brother. Very good question. Are the signs different amongst adults and of children? So the children's brain is developed in a different developmental stage than the adults. So you'll see children making more riskier decisions. Just in general, teenagers make dumb decisions. Kids make dumb because their brain is uh, is different. So one thing you would notice, yeah, they would probably engage in more riskier business. They would isolate a lot more from their friends. And you'll notice more changes in the area of academics. So for kids, we can pick it up quicker because we could see it in their grades. We can see in how they're interacting with their peers. We can see it in other things. In adults, we're not in school. Some adults work from home. Some adults aren't around other people as much as children are. With adults, you see more loss of interest. Um, you see disengagement from family, from other things that they're doing. Um, but for children, yes, you would see more riskier behavior and you would see more academic changes. And with adults, depending on who they are and where they are, you'd see more changes in like interest and more substance abuse and things of that nature. As far as, as far as du'as are concerned, I think nothing, but nothing can come near to our salah, which we open with Surah Fatiha. These are, this is the great gift that we have been given, Surah Fatiha. You know, when the king was bitten by a serpent and the companions were visiting him and he needed a cure, they read Surah Fatiha and he was cured. And when they came back to base and they said, asked, where did you learn this from? It was obvious. Surah Fatiha is the start of everything. But the parents have got to do it with the kids. I cannot tell my kid, go into the room and make the salah. I have to lead by example. I'm the one under the microscope. This is where I fail. 
I have got to go through the inconvenience, the dedication, the, the time effort to demonstrate to my children that I am prepared to do this. And when I have a difficulty as well, man, this is hard getting up for Fajr in the morning. I must share it with my children. He's human. I am human. We have these difficulties. We must share it. The best dua, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasan. Such a simple, basic dua. Rasulullah, again, when somebody was dreadfully ill and he asked him, what dua do you make? And he said, I, I ask for Allah to give me all my punishment in this life so that I would be safe in the next. Rasulullah said to him, no, you should make the basic dua. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina nar. And this person had become as thin as a rake and then he blossomed out. But the idea is stick to the simplicity, stick to the basics. Don't go for the big things and do it with them. And when you have a complaint, complain to them as well. I'm finding this very difficult. What do you think? But then we are coming down from our ivory towers and they see us as human as well. And they say, he's got a problem too, so I can help him. And in helping me, they are helping themselves. This deen of ours is so all encompassing. It is wonderful. But we have to start by scrutinizing ourselves. And we've got to be big enough to say, I made this mistake, I made that mistake. That's where we have to go. So alhamdulillah, you know, we, when we choose the easy path always, you know, we want to be 210%. Take the easy path. Go with the ease. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa also always took the path of least resistance. Why go for the big ones? Go with the easy ones and compliment all the time. If we're going to tell somebody, you know, you failed that math paper, you're doing this, you do, the person begins to feel inadequate and suffers depression. The parent is the magic he looks up to. And I'm telling him, you failed math, you did this, you did this. I'm contributing to the problem. By this community opening up this topic they are telling us look at yourselves look at how you contribute to this problem mashallah alhamdulillah we really thank this community for opening our minds any questions from the system i have one question coming in from online actually um is there any statistical data which shows that anxiety levels have increased in covid um in COVID patients due to this disease, post effects of COVID. So I guess the question is, you know, we've gone through almost two years now coming up on this um, pandemic. Um, is there any statistical uh, evidence for saying how that is impacting stress levels? Without a doubt, the, all the statistics support, particularly with anxiety, because people with anxiety have different type of coping mechanisms. So being social, being out. Um, you have those coping, me coping mechanisms when you don't have that. And then you have this pandemic on top of it. Anxiety was one of the mental illness disorders that actually went up the highest. Um, and now when we come back to life, it's not what it used to be. It's a new normal, right? So we're not just adjusting back to, okay, it was COVID and now we're back. We still have the fear looming that's there. So a lot of the research, if you want specifics, if, if you can get the person's contact information, I can give them specific research. But the numbers of anxiety levels, early on anxiety was peaked. Um, so again, coping mechanisms were not there anymore. Um, so that peaked. And now afterwards, we're, we're at a new normal. So people are still adjusting to that. Yes. So I'd like to ask Imam Rauf if he can share some of his thoughts on uh, what we've uh, heard and discussed today. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Amma ba'd. Uh, so far, we would like to thank uh, our brother and our sister for their presentations. Uh, and we know how important this topic is, so I don't have to emphasize that um, for the community and for individuals. Um, what I uh, would like to say, actually, I, I had a question. I think it may have been answered already by Sister Shema, um, but uh, I think it is important also to focus on the causes. Uh, so. Uh, what I would like to know is, is um, 
what are the main causes that lead to depression. If we know the causes, perhaps we can make some uh, 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 devise some preventative methods. And so that, that is one thing. But before you <laughs> answer this, this the, um, uh, I also would like to add to what um, uh, Barmubin said. Uh, there's a hadith al 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 mu'min qawiyyu, the strong believer, khairun wa ahabu ila Allahi min al mu'min al daif is better and more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa taala than the weak believer. Wa fi kullin khair. In both of them, there is good. Uh, so the Prophet Adam is urging us to be strong in all ways. The 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 um, the Mufassirin or the, uh, the the scholars have commented on this and say it is strength in all different ways. Um, uh, it is strength of iman. It is also physical strength, and we can also talk about me mental strength, mental health. Uh, that is, uh, and yes, uh, there are some specific some to ask asking specifically for health. Uh, uh, you know, from uh, uh, being away from any difficulty whatsoever. There's a word, a comprehensive word that is used in a number of du'as and that is al-afia. Al-afia means good health uh, and, you know, all, uh, all goodness all around, all around goodness, right? Keeping away from any trouble, any, any, ba uh, any uh, anything bad and so on. Allahumma inni asaluka al-afwa wal-afia. Wallah, I ask you for pardon as well as al-afia, which is, you know, protection in all ways, health and otherwise, right? Uh, and this actually, this dua or par, uh, this dua also comes in our salah, uh, in uh, uh, between the the two sajdas, when we get up from the first uh, sajda, uh, there is a dua to say which includes this. A number of things we ask for about seven things, uh, we ask for at that time, which includes al afia. So. Um, uh, there are these du'as that we should, we probably know already some of them and we should uh, learn more of them. Also, uh, one other thing, um, I, I would like to uh, like examine uh, the Islamic sources and especially the seerah uh, for uh, 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 an answer uh, to uh, or a way of treating uh, depression. Uh, in fact, preventing it from the very beginning and then treating it if it occurs. Uh, and I, <clears throat> um, so we see, uh, uh, we see in the life of the Prophet Sallam, maybe things that could have caused him depression, many situations that could have caused him depression, and how did he prevent that from happening to himself? How did he overcome those situations and so on? Uh, th these are all there in the seerah for us to look at. Uh, and there is the story of Julai Bib. I think many of us uh, know that story. <coughs> uh, uh, one, one of those great Sahaba, uh, you know, as a young man, there were several disadvantages that he had. He came from a poor family, so he was he was very poor. Uh, he was ugly. He was the ugliest man in town, <laughs> uh, and so on. The Prophet once asked him, uh, 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 "Are you not getting married?" And he said, you know, well, who will marry me? I'm so ugly, you know, who's going to marry me? Uh, and the Prophet Sallam said that, you know, I will help you. Uh, and uh, I, I don't want to go into the, you know, the details of the story. Uh, and the Prophet Sallam, you know, pointed out the family to him, to him. And he went to that family. Uh, and when uh, they knew that he came to ask for their daughter, uh, they, you know, took a step back, you know, how <laughs> we don't want such a person. Uh, but the daughter herself said that if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and of course he mentioned that, he mentioned that the Prophet Sallallahu sent me, and she said that if the uh, Prophet Sallallahu sent him, then I have no objection whatsoever, and he got married. And he became Shaheed soon after that, also after his marriage. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala really blessed him. Uh, so this is one uh, a situation that could have caused him depression. July Bib, uh, you know, nobody wants him because he, because of his poverty, because of his ugliness, uh, and so on. So, um, Sister Shima, the, the question is about um, the the causes for uh, the depression. 
Thank you. And, and a lot of people want to know what causes it. And that is a good question. And, and depression is a very complex disease. So there is no medical what, like we don't know what exactly causes it. There isn't one thing that causes it. But we do know that people who have a predisposition, um, previous family history of it can cause depression. Uh, trauma can lead to depression. Life changes can lead to depression. Um, losing a job, losing a loved one, all these types of things can lead to a depression. So the what and the why is very important, but I would argue the how is even more important. How do we help someone who is depressed? How do we prevent someone from going to the place of, of suicide and getting even further? So the what is important. The what is important. It's an important question. But before we get to the what and the, the why, let's go to the how. How can I help you? How can I be here for you? How can I meet you where you are? You're in a dark place. I want to sit there with you. I want to be there. How can I help you get out of that? And then in that process, we learned what caused that for them. Why are they in the position that they're in? There isn't one, one cause or one. There's no, because it's such a complex disease, there isn't one answer to what causes it. But I think what's important is what we're doing now is, is part of the how. How do we do it? We start having discussion. How do we do it? We make the message of the place where people can come to and have this type of conversation. Any other questions? You have a question. So uh, it's not really a question. I just wanted to comment uh, in the earlier part of today's sessions. Uh, there was a presentations, and then a sister highlighted some of the factors which contribute to that mental instability. So those were primarily related to uh, uh, financial well-being, family related or personal related. But I strongly feel nowadays each one of us uh, is, is living in an unprecedented conditions and especially in a broader perspective when we look about the sufferings of the human beings, atrocities committed across the world and the people are being marginalized, not on one incidences, there are so many incidences and they are, are recurring over a period. So being a Muslims and being oversensitive about those human sufferings also create an overwhelming uh, mental conditions. And at times you feel like you are not in a capable or have the capacity to handle or contribute to improve that situation. So being a Muslim, uh, we have to get the, uh, the select from, from our faith. That, that's the strongest point we can have. But I need some professional advice, you know, uh, in terms of the comfort, in terms of the financial well-being. Alhamdulillah, living in this country, we are well off. We, we don't have those challenges, you know, day to day. But it, it's more of a broader perspective, you know, how do we face that situation? And as an individual, how we can contribute to improve that condition? A very good question, right? So there are internal uh, or immediate parochial causes that can get to it. But as Muslims, all of our hearts and minds bleeds every time you uh, uh, reflect on the reality of what is happening uh, to the Ummah. So what are some of your thoughts on that? Maybe, Brother Mubin, you can. You know, none, none of this, this is a very flat statement. None of this should surprise us. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said to us, there will come a time, there will come a time when holding on to faith would be so difficult, it would be like juggling hot coals. So these things have been told to us that there are, are going to be real undulations ahead. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said to us, there will come a time when a believer would walk past a grave and hope that he was in it. What precipitates things like that? It is the surrounding circumstances. It's the challenges that prevail at the time. So these things are going to happen. It's going to be very difficult. And under those circumstances, sticking to our rudimentary basics is very important. We should, with our families, Make sure that we obey the rules of Allah. We are making our salah. We are making our dua. We are regularly asking for forgiveness. Because these are the tools we have. But we should not be surprised that it's getting more and more difficult. Because we have been told 
Imagine juggling your barbecue coals with your bare hands. That's as difficult as it's going to be to keep up our iman. This has been told to us. It's not a surprise. It is something that we have to buttress ourselves up for by sticking to our basics with tenacity. Don't be, we should not be judgmental. If we slip, we recognize it as a slip and we build stronger. That's what we have to do. And we cannot be finding fault with our younger people. If they are slipping, we have to help to hold them up. And if we are slipping, that the unit has got to be supporting. That's what we have to talk about. But none of this should be really surprising. What's going to happen is it's going to, the, the, the undulations are going to get worse. Imagine, why would you hope to be in a grave? What is so bad outside there that you hope you were in that grave? This is a hadith. And the only way around it is to stick to our basics, our strength. Remember we said spiritual muscle. We have to cultivate it and we have to use it. That is the only way you can stand up against the state of the art army of Fir'aun. Any questions from the sister side? So I think, um, oh, we have a question here. Assalamu alaikum. I just want to ask a general question about um, like for kids, like young kids who are grows up in uh, like in a broken families where like you know father and mother are divorced, they were separated, where like no co proper communication between the parents, and you know one side trying to pull to the, the Islamic uh, way of raising kids, other side is not cooperating, and the kids like being you know in between. How can we help our kids with that? Yeah. And the other thing is like uh, if we can get sister uh, information. So maybe, inshallah, that can be um, the, the last question. Sister Shima, I did have a couple of requests for people asking for your professional contact information uh, if they want to reach out and have some. So maybe if you can share that as well. And I think, uh, so what we'll do is it's almost, um, what is that, 8.20 almost, right? So inshallah, around 8.25, we'll break. We'll go pray Isha. Please, 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 after Isha, come back to the school the main desk and we'll have um, food to go for everyone. Jazakallah khair. So my, the best way to reach me is through email. So it's Shima, my first name, S-H-E-E-M-A, the number five at gmail.com. Shima five at gmail.com. Um, and to answer the question about uh, parents who are divorced and separated, and we have different upbringings one parent wants to do something another parent wants to do something and really what happens in all of that is the child gets lost and a lot of times the child feels like they have to pick what one parent's doing over the other um, and if there's anything that you can ever come together on and I've seen a lot of parents who are divorced is even when you're trying not to get back at the other parent inadvertently you are through your child inadvertently the child gets put in the middle the best thing to do whether you're one parent or the other is to sit with the child and say what is it that i'm doing that is helping you what is it that i'm doing that's not helping you they will give you the answers of what they need we can't assume it um so if one parent is more religious and wants to bring them up in the dean and the other parent is not and that becomes a place of contention between the parents the child is sitting in the middle thinking what did i do wrong the last thing you want to do is make your child feel wrong only thing you can do is check in with them and say, please tell me what is working, what is not working. Talk to me about that. And without a doubt, your child will open up about that. If they don't, they'll, and you don't ask that, they'll act it out in other ways. So no questions from the sisters? Okay. So again, on behalf of MCMC, I would really like to extend... Uh, my sincere thanks. I would ask everyone in attendance to please make dua for Sister Shima and Brother Mubin to put more barakah and blessings in their work and that we uh, have further opportunities to benefit from the expertise that they bring. Jazakumullah khair. And like I said, um, what we'll do is um, I uh, work with Dr. Miraj and other people in our community and figure out how we extend. This was, you know, 101. 
we need to go to 200 and 300 level um, uh, courses and looking at this topic. So inshallah, we'll look at uh, what further things we could do. Um, I ask, uh, so all of you, please, what we'll do is we'll break for Isha. And then after Isha, please do come to the front desk in the, in the student lobby, not the main veranda, but the student lobby. We'll have dinner for everyone to go. And uh, with that, I'd like to ask Brother Mubin if you can uh, close out the session with dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta al-sami'u al-alim. Wa tub alayna innaka anta al-tawabu rahim Wa aghfir lana dhunubana wa dhunub walidayna wa mashayikhina wa jami'i al-mu'minina ajma'in. Ya ghafur rahim we knock on your door tonight, Ya Ghafur rahim We ask you to open our minds to the problems of this life so that we can address the problems of this life using the tools that you have given us, technical tools and spiritual tools. Ya Ghafur rahim forgive us for all the mistakes that we make knowingly and unknowingly. Ya Ghafur rahim those that are sick, ease their burdens, cure them, Ya Ghafur rahim Grant them shifa, return them to your service. Those, Ya Ghafur Rahim, who have passed, lighten their graves, widen their graves, save them from the torment of the graves. Those who are experiencing hardships, those that are living under challenging circumstances, Ya Ghafur Rahim, reward them for their tolerance, increase their iman, and reward them, Ya Ghafur Rahim. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiul alim. وتب علينا إنك أنت تواب الرحيم اللهم اغفر لأهل القبور من المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات ارفع لهم الدرجات وكفر عنهم السيئات يا رب العالمين ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين جزاكم الله خير. So we'll break inshallah for Isha. If I can just ask one or two brothers, if you can come back after Isha, we just have to do a little bit of uh, setup here.